It is uh, my pleasure today uh, to welcome you and to also welcome Francis Mays and Andine Cohen. Uh, Francis Mays is the New York Times bestselling author of several books about the voluptuousness of Italian life, including Under the Tuscan Sun, Bella Tuscany, and See You in the Piazza. She's also a widely published poet and essayist who's written numerous memoirs, books of poetry, and novels, including Women in Sunlight. Formerly a professor of creative writing at San Francisco State University, she's now a full-time writer, traveler, and divides her time between North Carolina and Tuscany. We also have co-author Ondine Cohen today, a contributing editor at Condé Nast Traveler, who writes regularly for the New York Times Travel Section, among many other publications. She's appeared on CNN and Good Morning America, and co-hosts Condé Nast Traveler's Insider Guide series on PBS. Um, she lives in the Renaissance town of Pienza in Southern Tuscany and owns two boutique hotels um, and is joining us from Italy today, um, although not Pienza, but we'll, in a moment, we'll talk about where you are right now, perhaps. Um, so let's start by just checking in with uh, Francis and Andine. Hi, We're happy to be here. Welcome. Thank you. And, well, and Francis, I'm, you're in North Carolina. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in North Carolina. I'm in my study here. It's totally raining outside, so I've been actually writing today for um, an unusual activity. And Ondine is signing in from Puglia. Now, where are you, Ondine, exactly? Well, I am in the Salento near Lecce and Otranto, uh, one of my favorite parts of uh, the country, um, near the boot of uh, Italy. So we have uh, both coastlines about half an hour away and it's just a beautiful part of the country. I remember being in Puglia at this time of year when the orchards are all in bloom and you drive through these immense olive groves. They have olive grove, olive trees in Puglia that are this big around and bigger. They've been there a thousand years. They make our little Tuscan olive trees look like twigs. They're just so ancient. It's, it's kind of a, a privilege to be among them even. And it's, it's oh. such a region because we had, uh, there were all of these invasions here. So you have the Greek architecture, you have Norman architecture, you have obviously beautiful Baroque towns. Uh, it's, a, it's really one of the most beautiful parts of the country. It is. It's getting quite uh, well known now. It used to be just whoever went to Puglia, but it is such a treat to go there because the food is different down there. It's uh, very vegetable oriented and they bake these loaves of bread that are this big around. Literally, they weigh 10 pounds and the bread is so good that you find yourself going, running in little fornos, buying a section and then pulling off pieces of it in the car and eating it as you drive. And it's bread, not cake, but it's so, the bread is the best in Puglia. So I, I know you're going to have a great week there. That sounds just heavenly. And meanwhile, we're in the rain in North Carolina. But um, we were going to show the slides first or? Yes, yes. Okay. And I, I see that, yeah, we've got more people coming in. I just, and I wanted to make sure that we waited to do that since I had the little um, miscommunication just say earlier. That, um, so, yeah. Oh, yes. This book um, has 350 photographs in it. So we just are going to have a little dip into some of the photographs. Uh, the book's published by National Geographic. And, you know, they are always known for their um, illustrated books. So um, we had access to their archives and then they sourced, according to our text, many other, I think they're 350. So this is just a tiny smattering of the photographs you'll see in the book. So um, yes, I will go ahead and uh, bear with me everyone for a moment. I'm going to put up the slideshow and then um, share my screen. Um, and 
Francis and Andine may have some comments as we go, and we'll, we'll go through some of these gorgeous uh, images from the book uh, to get started. Um, and again, this is always Italy. And I'm going to try to make this full screen as well. Bear with me for just a moment. There we go. It's kind of an iconic shot. I think this is Piemonte. Piemonte North, north of Italy. Venice, of course. Yes, they managed to get a shot where there weren't many people. Oh, this is, I love this. Um, Here we go. Mm. I love this uh, this shot. It's just spectacular to be in one of those little valleys and see the sunset or the sunrise, whichever way you're looking, in the Dolomites. It's a monastery garden. Mm. This is where um, Lange, no, in Piedmonte again. Oh, Andine, here's your favorite person. My truffle hunter <laughs> in uh, near Alba, which is the most famous region for truffles in Italy. Is that the dog we just heard? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think my dog would like to be a truffle hunter too. That's such a great shot of truffles. These uh, Piemonte cheeses, I think the Tomas are so good. That whole area in the north is, it rivals the best of France, I think, for cheeses. Church uh, bells ring. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Lago d'Orta, way up near um, Lake Maggiore. And this is uh, the little town of Orta, San Orta, is right across from this island. The island only has this um, complex. A convent on it and just a few houses, but it's such an idyllic place in the Italian lakes, quite out of the way. And then this is uh, one of my passions, kind of the made in Italy uh, fashion designs uh, in Milano, Corso Como, which is. Um, has international brands, but also you go in there and you see a lot of local young talent from Milan and all over the country. It's uh, Milan is just full of great furniture design, fashion design, um, architectural inspiration. So I, especially living in the countryside, going up to Milan is a treat to see sort of what's going on on the cultural, architectural, fashion, design front. Also vintage. <laughs> this is in Cremona where they're very famous for this Mostarda. It's a, a way of preserving these beautiful fruits that are um, not sweet. They're accompaniments for meat and Cremona's very famous for those. Pickles, pickles. No, this, that was a cocktail, wasn't it? Oh, this is, this is Como. And Como, uh, that part was sort of Como beyond George Clooney, the idea of kind of, you know, Como is sort of famous for being quite glitzy and, um, full of sort of celebrities and stuff, but it's just, you just look at this photo and you think, my gosh, it's picture perfect. It's a beautiful place. And you can still stay in like a mom and pop type of bed and breakfast. You don't need to kind of go splashy. <laughs> Back canal of Venice. 
which is one of the great walking cities. So this is on Dean's, one of her favorite places, right? Yeah, Cinque Terre, which is the five, uh, five lands, fishing villages that are all UNESCO, United Nations, uh, 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 preserved and just those pastel colors, the the hiking trails, the water. It's it's a little bit more touristy now, but it's still one of the most beautiful places I think in Italy. Well, you're going to get to go there next week, so you'll have the pleasure of experiencing it without tourists, many tourists there. What a treat that'll be! Excited to see it. The Vernazza is one of your favorite towns, isn't it? Vernazza is beautiful because the square is right on, on the water. And so it's like having a piazza and then the sea in front of it. Um, so especially with kids, it's amazing because there are no cars there. So you can just, the kids run around the piazza, you eat dinner, and it's, uh, it's really like Italy from the 1950s. Sounds good. This is outside Trieste, um, which was one of the great surprises of writing the book. Trieste is the farthest east you can get in Italy and almost seems like a world unto itself. This uh, castle um, is on the coast and it's uh, near where Rilke wrote the Duino Elegies, which is just a little bit farther down. The Trieste is built along the sea. It's just a beautiful promenade along the sea. And of course, it's the city of coffee because um, Ely Coffee is there. And they're just great coffee shops, old world coffee shops everywhere in Trieste. And there's a statue of James Joyce because he lived there for many years. And it's a just wonderful strolling city. Again, these mountain passes, these high upland green meadows. There's so many hiking trails in Northern Italy and little tiny places you can stay, the Refugi, where you can either stop for a, a hearty lunch and usually hear some old fashioned music or some of them have very simple rooms and you can stay, they're great hiking trails uh, everywhere in addition to the usual winter sports, which is what most people go there for. Um, but like, it's a beautiful place to go in the summer as well. Like you said in the book, it's so, it's fascinating to think it almost looks kind of like Heidi territory. Um, yes. Switzerland, you know, that uh, Alps. When you think about that coming to somewhere like Sicily or Sardinia, um, it feels part of, an, of Northern Europe. And then, you know, in a couple of hours, you can be here in central Italy and in Tuscany. Yes. Everybody knows probably where this is. It's Florence. That's the iconic site, I guess, is the white Vespa. You always kind of have to think of Fellini with that. Um, I bought my husband one of the Fellini style, the retro style Vespas many years ago. And he just takes it as part of his identity that he goes into town to get the bread on his white Vespa. And everybody, almost every Italian household has some kind of little motorized way of getting around. But the Vespa is just, uh, it's in the Italian heart. That is Rimini. No, sorry, Arezzo. Rimini, Arezzo. Arezzo. Arezzo, which has one of the most amazing um, antiques market um, in the country. And I know that Francis really enjoys going and looking at uh, all the little treasures from uh, around Tuscany around the country. Yeah, I've furnished three houses from that antiques market. Um, I still love going. My husband is not that enthusiastic anymore. <laughs> he used to be, but um, 
it's an intense experience because they have like 300, 350 dealers at times. And it, it, to me, it's really fun. And he will go, but I think too many times he's left that town with a table on top of his head. So, <laughs> ah, this Aww. is dreamy. Oh, I love that. This is in Umbria. Um, it's a beautiful wildflower meadow that people travel to see every year when, when that eruption of wildflowers occurs. It's, uh, it's near Norcia and it's the same area where all the great Umbrian sausages are made. It's also famous for lentils. Well, this is down near where you are, isn't it, Ondine? No, this, this, is, this, this is Sicily, isn't it? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't know where that is. There are a lot of places, lots of places that look just like that, but we know we're in Rome here, don't we? <laughs> one of those places where I go every time I go to Rome. It's so good. They have this thing called Supli, which is like a, um, almost like a risotto covered with the pastry. And then sometimes they put pesto, sometimes they put meat. It's amazing. And there's always a huge crowd of Romans outside. So it's, you know, tourists go there as well, but it's sort of the go-to place for sliced pizza and, um, and souply. Just in driving along, you come upon these places you can't believe exist. And even driving home from the Rome airport to Cortona, you see these isolated medieval places up on the hill. It makes you just want to turn off the road. Like every 15 miles, <laughs> there's another one. That's so beautiful. Capri, which of course, uh, Jackionassis uh, Paestum. Yes, this is the, in the south of Italy and in Sicily particularly, it's such a treat to visit the Greek ruins because even if you've been to Greece, you're overwhelmed by what's left of the Greek world in, in Italy. Uh, and this is um, one in, in Lazio, not far from Rome, and it's just standing there out in the field. Sicily is full of Greek ruins. It's such a surprise. Oh my! Labrie. Oh my! This is right below Tropea, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that's what I was saying right? when you think about the Alpine part of the country, which looks like very Heidi and you know, Alps and mountains, and then look at a beach like this sort of looks like it could be the Caribbean, the white limestone cliffs. It's, it's like a, you could be in a completely part of the different part of the world. And that's why I really enjoy uh, the country because as Francis points out, it's the size of Arizona. And to imagine that within that size of a country that you can see you know these cows grazing up in the hills and then something that like is powder white and completely different uh, this has got to be one of the most raucous uh, markets in the world this is in palermo uh, sicily has fabulous markets i love the fish market in catania it's like you've stepped into the middle ages with all these hawkers and you're up to your ankles in fish juice and it's just quite a scene. This is of course vegetables and look at those artichokes on either side of the front of the picture. It's uh, a great time to be in Italy during artichoke season. Ah, also Sicily. These are familiar I'm sure to most people. The ricotta stuffed crispy pastries that are just um, addictive. And if you're in Sicily, you gotta have at least one a day. I love the chocolate ones particularly. Sardinia. This, is not, this, is, this was not one of our favorite photos, but somehow it ended up in the book. But it's a colorful place to stay, I guess. <laughs> there we are. 
are. <laughs> and there we are with our little vest, uh, little ape. The ape means bees, bee, and they do buzz around like little bees. These are real cute work vehicles you see all over Italy. They have one steering wheel in front, um, but often you see two or three people crammed in the front seat. So that's just a little taste of um, all the photos in this book. And as Andine was saying, the um, diversity of Italy is I think what we both came away with the most of any other sensation. Of course, we both lived there forever and we knew that Italy was so different from North to South. But actually going to all 20 regions of Italy uh, just brought that home in such a concrete way that I, I'll never get over it. And I will always feel that I'm just beginning to know Italy because of that fact. It's um, got a lot left to reveal, no matter how many times, how many lifetimes you would have going there. We saw that beautiful picture of the beach in Calabria. That was one of the surprise areas to me. I'd never, before we started this, I'd never been down to Calabria. I had barely been in the Silicata, in Molise, and in most of the north. So it was so exciting to travel for this book and get to experience all of these extremely uh, different different places uh, you go 10 miles in italy and you're in a different uh world um different dialects different kinds of pasta different things growing different architecture it's amazing that it persisted in keeping its integrity and its individuality from zone to zone and i think it's because um Italy's such a young country in a way. It's the oldest country imaginable in many, but um, it didn't unify until, you know, 1865. So before that, it had all these little kingdoms, the Papal States, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, the Bourbon areas, the really rich fiefdoms, dukedoms that individuals held and kept their workers in practically a state of serfhood. So people could not travel within Italy. There were these mountains coming down the middle, making little tiny isolated communities, cutting off one side of Italy from the other. So much geography as well as history conspired to uh, keep it so that these places blossomed on their own and developed on their own. and. That is why Italy is the most diverse country to visit in the world, because of this, this fact that they were so geographically isolated. Calabria is where a lot of Americans, um, Italian Americans come from. I'd never been there. It is astonishing. Uh, Puglia, where Ondine is, I had been several times, but um, I've now been down there six or seven times, and it's a whole world to explore. But I think the biggest surprise to me was the north because I love Venice and I knew the area of the Veneto a little bit around Venice, but I did not know the Dolomites and I never knew that I would fall in love with those green, green, clear, cold lakes to me, that was just such a gift to be able to discover those on hikes. And some of them you can't go in. They don't, they don't allow you to go in some of them, but you can put your feet in until, until they freeze practically. But hiking in that area was one of the great discoveries, great joys. And I didn't expect to like the northern food. I thought it would be getting non-Italian getting more toward Germanic food and absolutely loved it and just can't wait to go back. Um, I think uh, Ondine particularly has written about all the exciting things to discover in outdoor Italy. 
which you don't really see written about that much. You go to Italy for, you go there for history and art and cuisine and wine and so forth and so on. But Italy is fabulous for outdoor adventures and Fondine being also among her many, many accomplishments, a marathon runner. Uh, she brought a lot to this book in terms of suggestions for people to get outside and discover Italy. What were your, some of your favorites, Dean? Well, I love the network of national parks that are throughout the country. For instance, in Tuscany, you know, you tend to the region as obviously Florence, Siena, the hill towns. But, for example, there is a beautiful national park, which is the National Park of the Marema. And it's the ex-duke uh, ex, uh, of Tuscany who gave this land to Tuscany to be a national park. And you can be out there running and sailed for, um, you know, hair. You go to the swath of beach that is close to... Um, close to some really developed parts of Tuscany, but there you feel like completely in nature. I also just think running is such a wonderful way to see a place in general. I ran the Rome Marathon twice and getting to be at the starting line by the Colosseum and then suddenly turn a corner and see the Vatican without any traffic in the city is really kind of mind-boggling. Well, that um, area of the Molise that you particularly liked, I, I thought that trip you described where you can get on this little vintage train sounded like fun. If you're not really up for hiking in the mountains of the south, that little train sounded great. But there are some, there are many, many great places to hike down following those old sheep trails where they take the migration of the sheep up into higher pastures all those have become trails and now there's a uh, possibility of uh, linking all these national parks throughout Italy so I think we we were good discoverers for um, bringing all these places to attention because it's something that's really developing in Italy right now. I, I, we had different skills, different interests. Um, I love archeology span and never get tired of going into the archeological museums, no matter how many uh, ancient uh, pins and belts they display, I never get bored with them, how many bowls. Um, I like, I did a lot of the work on the wine. I like art a lot. Ondine has focused a great deal on artisan design and uh, just new places that uh, we wanted to emphasize, particularly what's new in Italy, not just the old. And I think I, I learned a lot about seeking out artists and designs from all the things you brought forth. That was great. Um, and the, hotel, the hotels here are so amazing because you can really, you know, go from an agriturismo, which is like a working farm where you can stay with a family, quite inexpensive to, you know, obviously, uh, some of the most luxurious hotels uh, in the world. And, but the thing is that the idea of hospitality here is really, really strong. And that sense of local flavor and space and design and using traditional materials, but also updating them, it's that in itself could be a whole book of, of using traditional materials, uh, everything from ceramic, terracotta, different kinds of tiles, um, a marble, all of these things that are at our fingertips and seeing younger people, both uh, foreign and local sort of using 
the history of Italy, but also moving forward at the same time. For me, that's something that I'm very interested in. Yeah, that, that was a big focus in the book. Another really big focus was out of the way places. I had already written a book called See You in the Piazza, where I um, focused on little known places in Italy. And I think that was kind of what whetted my appetite to do all 20 regions. Because when I started that other book, I felt like I was rediscovering some sense of spontaneity in travel. Because if you just go to the uh, places that you've known about and heard of and wanted to see, like Rome, Siena, Venice, Florence, you have to go there. They're the best. They're fantastic. But when you get off that track and into places where there aren't other people, you just get a different sense of the country and you get much more of a hit of the authentic Italy. For instance, that little town down in Puglia or Sara, which is where I had a big revelation about that kind of travel. Osara is just a tiny town and there was a little market going on. These women were buying very voraciously these gnarly little things that looked like dried up onions. They turned out to be hyacinth bulbs. And who knew that hyacinth bulbs were uh, something that were, they were really valued uh, for their tasty addition to sausages. Um, all kinds of things you just come upon in little out of the way places. And in that same town, there was a bread oven from the 1500s. So I, going to all these little places, I felt like I was rediscovering how to travel. And I determined then that from, from now on, when I'm planning trips, I will always try to include the places that I don't really know anything about where there is still a lot to learn and a lot of um, experiences that are not in any way prescribed, which if you're just following a typical guidebook, you're going to be in steps with a lot of other people. But if you just um, turn off that GPS and take the road that looks interesting, uh, there's, there's just so much to do and so many places that you come upon that you never ever forget. You have a little glass of wine. They say it's from the vineyard down in the valley and you say, can you get this wine anywhere else? No, you can't. It's things that are unique unto themselves. And every place, every place, uh, every region has so many of these. So mass travel, we all know, is upon us. Everybody's traveling. Everybody, not right now, but until about six months ago, everyone from all over was traveling. I've been uh, going to Italy for more years than I can even count, but I have owned a house there for 30 years. And... Um, I just can't, it's hard to imagine how much travel has changed during that time. Early on, no one from Eastern Europe was traveling. No, you never saw anyone from South America. There were no Russians. Um, about 15 years ago, maybe 20, you started seeing a lot of Japanese travelers. Now everybody's traveling. There's so many Russians traveling. So many people from Brazil, we still have a lot of people coming to our house, Bramasole, because they've read or seen the movie Under the Tuscan Sun. And I can't tell you how many Brazilians there are. Um, Australians, biggest travelers in the world, and such friendly people. Everyone wants to travel. So there's no chance that you're going to go to Florence and find that it's not mobbed with tourists unless you go in the dead of winter, which is magnificent if you can travel then. But that off-season travel is the way to go if you can. But it's also trying to balance the places that are well-known and that you really want to see. Assisi, 
you've got to go to Assisi. But um, there are other little tiny towns in Umbria where um, there's no one, and it's much more of a sense of discovery to walk into the church and see this uh, beautiful fresco with no one else around you. I, I love that, that sense of discovering places. So the, in this book, it's full of recommendations for places that aren't in the usual books. But it also covers very well the places that you, you know, everyone dreams of going. I mean, I can't imagine not going to Siena. Um, but mass travel is a factor, and there are just some ways to cope with it, and some ways to be a sustainable person, you know, a good traveler, things you can do, but uh, mainly, uh, if you if you travel wisely, you can avoid some of that um, feeling like you're just one of a bunch of people who are ruining a place. You know. <laughs> Wonder if we have any questions yet. Yeah, we have some. You do. You, you do. do. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Patricia. Okay. And so uh, what I'm going to do now for the folks who are attending is I'm uh, looking over the questions and I'll uh, bring them uh, to uh, Francis and Andine. And of course, uh, something that you were talking about, Francis, that I think is very important and on the minds of a lot of people is uh, what's it like uh, now that uh, the, we're in the age of the COVID-19 uh, quarantines and she wants to know what you and Andine have heard from friends and neighbors about Italy's experience with the pandemic. Francis, would you like to go first? I think Andine, since she's lived there during the whole thing, maybe you'd be a better one to answer that. Okay. I mean, uh, we were a little uh, ahead of obviously um, lockdowns in other countries. Um, I think Italy has handled it very well in terms of people following uh, the rules during the lockdown. Obviously, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, the economy comes from tourism and people are concerned about uh, when particularly Americans, British, North, uh, Northern Europeans can come back. So we're trying to weigh out the fact that so much of the economy is based on, on tourism with, like I said, uh, with safety precautions. And, you know, this, this feeling of maybe taking for granted how many people come here all the time and then all of a sudden you think yes it's true that certain cities and certain places have 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 almost not been ruined but you just feel like you're not as experienced for yourself with now this anxiety of these incredible places how are they going to survive how is you know the little mom and pop place on St. Mark's Square or in an alley. How are they going to survive in this time? So, gosh, it's a very complicated issue. I can't really say anything more than um, we just have our fingers crossed that there won't be another uptick and um, that all of these beautiful restaurants and hotels and museums and the places that we love, that they'll all be okay. Weren't you surprised that the Italians fell in line as much as they did? I mean, Italians are not exactly rule followers. They're more anarchistic people. But um, people seem to behave there with their mask and their distancing a lot more than they are here. Yeah, people were really, really serious about it. People were really serious, I think. You know, it's also um, a country where a lot of people live with their parents and their grandparents. So it was a very serious thing um, to be careful about bringing, you know, of, of, of following the rules. And uh, a lot of grandparents uh, still take care of their grandchildren. 
So there's a lot of like, we want to see our grandchildren as soon as possible. So we're going to follow these rules. And the minute the government says that we can be with our immediate family again, like people were very much uh, concerned about that aspect. And I think, I don't know, it's a, it's a very multi-generational country. And I think that's one of the things I love about it too. You know, in Pienzo where I live, in the main square, we have everybody from two to 99 and that, and we all hang out together and we all look out for each other. And um, not that that's not the same in other places, but I think it really made people think, okay, we don't want to put anyone at risk. We're just gonna do what we have yes. to do. So intelligent, uh, we're because we're experiencing here uh, people who are, take it just as a you know kind of a political stance that they will not wear a mask. It's insane. But I've been so proud of Italy because they were hit hard, and they really did what it took to to get beyond it. Not that anybody's really beyond it yet, but you know, to um, to get to where you can now go to Puglia anyway. Another question is uh, for Francis, what months do you normally, in normal times, uh, do you spend in Italy and, or do you alternate there in Cortona due to the bureaucratic residency requirements of Italy or is it just your choice? It's um, flexible according to what's going on in my life. Yeah, I'm usually there about five months a year. Um, always at the beginning, late spring, beginning of summer, and always for the olive harvest, which is one of our favorite times to be there. Other than that, it's just coming and going. Uh, it's flexible. But um, legally, I'm not supposed to be there more than 180 days a year. So I try to keep to that, um, and um, that seems fine because I really like living here in North Carolina as well. Uh, we live on a farm outside Hillsboro, and it's been such a joy to have this land uh, to play around in during this time we've had to be at home. So living in two countries is complicated. You always feel like, oh, where's my red sweater? It's there. All these things are different, but um, you know you have to kind of bounce back and forth. But I think it's just been a great uh, privilege to be able to see Italy from this perspective, and to, particularly for me to see the United States from an Italian perspective. And I have really liked that. I can't imagine not having that in my life. I hope I get to keep going back to. Italy for part of the year for the rest of my life. And I could live in either place very happily, but it's kind of at this point, like having two great husbands, like being a bigamist and you can't decide which one is, you know, which one you'd rather be with. <laughs> I like that one. So do the two of you have some recommendations for travel from region to region? And then, you know, once you arrive, how do you travel? Is it local transportation, renting a car? What's, what's, some, what's some tips and best practices? Well, I would say um, driving here is not necessarily for the faint-hearted, like especially if you come off a kind of jet lagged, kind of getting out of Fumuccino or one of the major airports. I, at this point, really kind of enjoy driving here. But at the beginning, um, it definitely took a certain amount of nerves. But obviously, from a sustainability perspective, an eco perspective too, the train system is actually really, really great here. Um, uh, and you can get, you know, somewhere from Rome to Naples in an hour now um, on the on the train system. So unless you really want to sort of meander through the countryside and make a lot of stops, I think actually you could absolutely not um, rent a car and just use the, the train system here. Um, I love the trains. I, I adore the fast trains because 
they're kind of like flying business class. You get your assigned seat and it's very comfortable and they come around bringing you sandwiches and coffee and you're there before you know it. I don't even want to be there yet because I want to be on the train looking out the window at the beautiful countryside going by. These fast trains are just amazing. They're 300, 350 kilometers an hour. So like from Florence to Venice, it's just no time. It's too fast. And we go by train a lot. My husband likes to drive. He early on found out that driving in Italy was a blood sport and he kind of took to it. So we do, for this book and for um, See You in the Piazza, we drove a lot. We loved that because we could load up the car with all these pastas from different places. When we came home from Puglia, we brought six of those huge loaves of bread and froze them when we got home so we could carry that over, fill up the car with all kinds of things. It's very easy if you're traveling now. It didn't used to be at all, but now many towns have mailbox and you can just quickly ship things home. They're there. They're home long before you are, and it's quite easy. It's not that expensive. So in, in terms of traveling, one thing I often do is send home a suitcase. Uh, if I don't want to be bothered with it, checking it on the train, on the plane, especially if I have several stops, I just send the suitcase home or send a box home, and it works quite well. A traveling in Italy is a pleasure. I think driving to me is unparalleled because I'm one who likes to say, oh, can we go down that road? Which of course you can't do on a train. So also Alitalia, the airline, the other small airlines within Italy. So you can get to Sicily quite easily, for instance, from Perugia which is near us, there's a small airport. It used to be that nothing went out of that airport except birds, but now they have quite a few flights and Florence Airport. You can fly within Italy if you have a limited amount of time. Uh, you can get to places quite easily on these little puddle jumper flights and um, that's quite easy. But I would recommend also, if you possibly can, to settle down in a place for a week, a small place, and really get to know that particular place. On the third morning you're there, the bar you've been going to will know you. They'll remember what, how you like your cappuccino, whether you want it hot or with not much foam. I, the personal connections that you can make in a small town are really to me at the heart of, of why I like to travel because you can just make such great connection with local people even if you don't speak much Italian the Italians love to talk um, most everybody around town has a few phrases of English or it doesn't matter you can just um, enjoy uh, the interaction of ordering and having a pleasant experience in a place but it is an intimate place to travel and, and the more you go to the smaller places the more you experience that also the smaller cities um, or the less known cities i won't say necessarily smaller like torino and genoa they are fabulous hardly anyone goes there when i first went to torino I said to my husband, where is everybody? Uh, this is a fabulous town. It's the greenest city in Italy. It's full of museums and some of the best food in the world. Where is everybody? So that, that goes back to my uh, preaching about getting to know uh, the Italy that most people don't really take the time to get to know. I'd like just, to pick up on a uh, question uh, on a, something you said, Francis, about making personal connections, because uh, there's a question about the tell the please the story of your friendship between you and Andine. Oh well, that was um, 
a just surprise meeting when I went to Pienza to have dinner at Ondine's uh, hotel restaurant with a friend. And the friend knew Ondine and we all sat together. So we just first got to know each other that way. And we had so much in common because we both have lived in Italy and life work is writing about it. So we just hit it off. And um, when I was asked to write this book for National Geographic, they said, you can have a co-author. And so I called on Dean immediately and said, would you be interested in traveling with me to the 20 regions of Italy? <laughs> She said, yes, I would. So her town, Pienza, is about 45 minutes from Cortona, where we live. And um, so we visit back and forth. We have lots of dinners. And uh, so, uh, lots of super flattered <laughs> that France has considered me for the, for the project and also the opportunity to work with the... Um, with a woman author who um, was such an advocate for Italy and um, really wrote a memoir that I think inspired a lot of women to feel like they could take up, go off, start a new life. So it wasn't just the fact of Italy, but somebody who, um, when you think about books like Eat, Pray, Love or Wild or other, you know, memoirs that have inspired me the opportunity to work with uh with a woman um also in a country where i'm not going to get too deep into this but you know it's quite a macho culture and um really fun also to see it from a female perspective um to to work with another woman and have people be like oh you guys are writers and you were, you know, you also cook, you know, not to generalize, but I've, I felt very privileged to do this project and, and humble now because Italy really misses the States. Like so many people in Pienza are like, when do you think the Americans are coming back? And Americans saying, we really miss Italy and this camaraderie, um, obviously from immigration, like so many people moved from, didn't move, had to leave Italy to go to the States. And so many people from the States find um, beauty here. And I felt very humble around, uh, around the, this moment and a sense of if we can show some kind of solidarity with this book of how many treasures there are here that, that's really what's important to me at this point. We both had, we had some trepidation about the title, Always Italy. Is that the right title? And then after all this happened, we thought, yes, that's the right title, Always Italy. It's always going to be there for us. Stephanie, do we have time for a few more questions? Yes, let's let's take a few more minutes. I know since um, and that was my fault. We got started a little bit late because I wanted to make sure that um, everybody uh, was able to to get in before we got started. So, okay. um, and we still have folks who are here and more questions. So, if everyone's okay with that, we'll we'll take a couple more. So there's a question uh, about. Francis, about your writing, and I'm going to fold two questions uh, in upon each other. Uh, one is about your writing process and how you uh, manage to create characters and also do justice to uh, them, but also create, describing physical locations. And then, of course, is there going to be a continuation of Under the Tuscan Sun or something similar to it? Uh, there, there's a real love of Sertaldo and just uh, what you did there. So if you might answer those, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Um, my writing process is erratic. I'm not a disciplined writer, but I've come to trust um, my uh, rhythm in writing which is that I don't do anything for a long time. And during that time, I'm 
thinking about it though. And then I sit down and I do a lot of work at once. So it's very erratic. Um, I look forward to the periods when I am writing because I do get a whole lot done in a period of days I can write 50 pages. But then there are weeks that go by and I don't do anything. I do gardening and cooking and all the other things that uh, require my attention, like cleaning out closets and old photographs. So I'm not a disciplined writer, um, but I do get my work done and I've come to kind of trust the process that when the mood strikes, um, I will do it. And I do especially well if I have a deadline because I can write to a deadline. I think I could write War and Peace by next week if I had to, you know, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm really um, not very, um, not very good to keeping at a schedule. My husband writes every morning very early and don't go near his study. He has this absolute rhythm and I've always envied that, but I've never really been able to do it. The writing about place is something I really enjoy and I think it's something that has carried through with every kind of writing I've tried to do. I grew up in the American South and I was uh, spoon fed all the great Southern writers, Eudora Welty and Thomas Wolfe, of course, and James Agee and Faulkner and all Flannery O'Connor, all the, you know, Southern writers are so steeped in sense of place. So I had this sense early on that um, landscape was not neutral, that where you are has a great deal of influence who you are and there's a shaping power to landscape and that intrigued me very much as a writer especially when I started writing about different places to put myself in that place and to try to imagine what it is in that landscape that makes the people there who they are and what are the forces in that landscape I felt very powerfully the southern landscape where I grew up the violence of it seem very reflected in uh, the character of the people. The storms, the fact that the limestone can fall away and take your house with it, the, just the kind of primitiveness of um, the, the weather here. So many powerful forces in the southern landscape that I loved. So when I got to Italy, I, I was looking for those things. So why are these people so generous? Why are these people so able to feel at home in time? What are the things in the landscape? So writing about it was the challenge, you know, trying to put on paper um, what it is in words that you experience, try to recreate in words um, a, a sensation that you had or a thought that you had. And that is a, a long story, you know, involved with how to write and we could talk about that for days but I trained myself as a poet I've written six books of poetry and I think for me studying poetry teaching poetry all those years had a great influence on the way I think about writing because I think in images I think recreating a sensation a place a taste if you can recreate it with using at least two senses, uh, you've made a good start in connecting with your reader. And there's a question about favorite photo in the book. Can each of you, but that's a hard one, I imagine. There's so many, but do each of you have a, a favorite photo that you want to direct people to really savor? Oh, Undine, do you? There's a photo from Puglia with a shot of figs, figs that are in season. And um, that sense of like kind of a warm summer day when you have a perfectly ripe fig, that photo speaks to that. It's like uh, tomatoes here too, and they're just warmed by the sun. That kind of simple, very, um, visceral thing that 
that photo of a of figs both uh, closed and cut open for me it was one of my favorite images in the book there are a lot of great food shots in the book and we haven't even talked about food it's so much a part of of the book we followed all these young chefs and tasted everything in sight um food oh six books could be written about the regional food of course i don't know that i have a favorite photograph but um I do love that one we saw in the beginning of the Dolomites in the distance because it just reminds me of of being so much in that place. It's also a photograph of my front yard, <laughs> which I always love to see because that to me is my quintessential view out into the world. So I guess that might be my one of my favorites. There's so many, there's 350, so... Um, let us know which ones you think are the best. Is there a suggestion, Dean, that you have about uh, travel, uh, airline travel? Um, someone is asking about travel advice, maybe within the next couple of years. Uh, what's I've, some suggestions? I've done it every which way. Um, I've done uh, American Airlines a lot. Um, either directly from the States to Rome um, or via Heathrow. Um, I've started doing Alitalia. They have this um, strange thing where you can bid on business class like two days before. And I've actually um, bought a ticket quite cheaply and then upgraded um, on that day. I don't know. I... I look around, it's, you know, part of it is how much you travel, like if you care about airline miles or if you want to just go for the best deal, you know, I'll go to Expedia, I'll look at different, um, at different things. I, I always feel like the less, uh, the fewer connections that you can make nowadays, the better because between weather and lines and then probably after Corona and taking your temperatures and all of this stuff. It's like, if you can do a direct flight, <laughs> it's probably better. I um, didn't you fly Norwegian? And I've flown once. Norwegian a couple of times. A lot of people are going Norwegian. They have really great fares. So yeah, you know, I just look around and I just think also like, are you okay with being delayed or do you have to get from X to Z and then, you know, if you have to go through the states, through various airports, giving yourself enough time and um, yeah, I, I'm just like, as long as I get there in one piece, I'm trying to take the move. We're really lucky here in the Raleigh-Durham area because we have uh, direct flights from RDU to uh, Paris and London. So it, it, it saves that stop in the Northeast where I used to always have to connect out of Philadelphia or New York. Now you can go, I, we fly to London a lot and then get a connection from London, either to Rome or Florence. Thank Just, you, so much. You, know, you have to look and see what those connection times are because sometimes they're not good. You don't want to stand around in Heathrow for eight hours. You know? no. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering those questions. Thank you for asking and for everyone visiting with us today. And, have and a thank you, Malaprops, one of the great Southern bookstores. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask, we had a couple other questions and I'm just going to ask Francis and Andine if I send you an email um, with those, if, if you reply back to me, then I can email the answers out to, to folks. Okay. But I don't want to, Andine, specifically since it's nighttime there for you, I want to I, I want to be conscious of, um, of the fact that you're joining us with a six hour time difference and, and not go on too much longer. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's such of a pleasure. Course you all and definitely if you send me an email absolutely any advice excellent um so i will uh follow up with our with our authors by email and um 
and try to get those other questions answered for y'all and send those out in a follow-up email okay. to everyone. Right. Um, Francis, thank you so much. It's always, thank of you. course, a pleasure to see you in the store. So we look forward to that next time. Thank and Andine, thank you so much uh, for thank joining you. us from Italy. Everyone, thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Yep, yeah, and we look forward to seeing Bye. you soon.